So I uh, received a question recently about uh, marriage and um, some of the modern practices uh, regarding marriage and other things um, and not marriage and whatever else you got out there. But it led to a lengthy study, actually. I realized there is actually a lot more material than I thought there was. And so I thought I really should come back and try to teach about this again and uh, try to deal with it from the simplest possible vantage point. And so that's what we're doing. We'll start with the idea about marriage being held in honor. Honorable is marriage and everything. It's really what the text says. But the reason for doing this is to define what is right and what is wrong, to define what is sin and what is not sin. We start with Hebrews 13.4 because it is the simplest possible way of dealing with this. <laughs> the fact is that God has prescribed a specific relationship in which we are able to fulfill uh, sexual desires. And this, is, this one relationship is the one that has authority from God for that activity. Everything else is classified as either sexual immorality or adultery. That's Hebrews 13, 4, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled. God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Um, yeah, again, in, in a more maybe literal translation, it says honorable is marriage in everything. Even its bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So there's a contrast between the bed of marriage and any other bed. <clears throat> what we're saying is there, there is such a thing as a bed. There is sexual desire. People have these. And there is a way to fulfill these things that God will allow, which is in marriage. If somebody fulfills sexual desire in any other relationship, it is either fornication, sexual immorality, if a person is not married, or it is adultery, if a person is married. That, that's the simplest possible definition is to set forward the positive. The, what is it that God says is the way to do this? The way to fulfill desire is in marriage. That is what he has set forth. Every other method is considered fornication or adultery. I.e., everything else that a person might do is a sin before God. So that has to be avoided. Um, I think that the passage is fairly plain about that, and it's great because it, it does set it forward. There's this one thing that God prescribes, everything else gets categorized as sin. Luckily, the Bible also defines marriage for us. <laughs> Since marriage itself um, is often in dispute, what constitutes marriage? The Bible defined marriage at the very beginning when God created us in Genesis 1, it is recorded at verse 27 that God created the human in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So to begin with, we are, as humans, male and female. There are two, which you have probably noticed by now. Genesis 2, 24 to 25, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. That is not simply, uh, people frequently think, well, this is because they're, you know, they're the first people, they live in a jungle, they don't know any better. It's, it, it's a euphemism, uh, fairly obvious what that means. The husband and wife are naked and not ashamed. It means the marriage bed is undefiled. But 
to put it another way, what you're reading in these verses is an adult male and adult female are joined together permanently without any shame, though they be nude. That's the idea. Go back. You've got male and female. These are not just humans. They are humans who have defined sexes. There is a male and there is a female, which is the way it is in nature. Everything in all of biology has got sex. There is male and there is female. Plants, animals, everything. Second point, a man leaves his father and his mother. That is not a child. A man leaves his father and his mother. That's an adult. Children do not marry. People do not have any um, authority in Scripture to fulfill sexual desires with children. When the two are to hold fast, this hold fast is to be cemented to. Um, they're fused into one thing and they become one the man and the wife are naked and not ashamed and we've already visited that but what we're getting at again this is our definition marriage in the bible is between two persons two adults two sexes it's permanent that's what he says from the beginning it was defined in this way it has always been defined in this way the Bible is not um, ignorant of the fact that people have come up with lots of other things in the meantime. But that's what God made. That's what was prescribed. That's what God joins together. Luckily, Bible also defines fornication. Uh, what is sexual immorality? Well, we've already defined it in a sense in the whitelist method. Right. The whitelist method is where you set forward a, po a positive thing. This is what is right. If it's not this, it's not right. So clearly the marriage relationship, one man, one woman for life is what is right. If it isn't that, it's not okay. But we do want to talk about this because I think it's an important concept to help us make sense of what's happening in the world. So you can think about clearly what you see um, and what you don't see, I guess. So you can understand what is this thing and where does it fit? Um, 1 Corinthians 6 is the place. And we've got a few verses, 15 to 16 and 19 to 20. We'll also go on to the seventh chapter because the thought continues. But notice here in 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 16, he said, don't you know your bodies are members of Christ. You're part of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. The first thing is, you in the flesh belong to Jesus. And if you're joined with Jesus in, in, you know, in the spirit, because you're a Christian, then what you are joining yourself to is what you are joining Jesus to. I am not a fan of the what would Jesus do movement or the what would Jesus do bracelets. <laughs> uh, that's very silly. But there is a kernel of truth in the idea that when you are a Christian, you are in fellowship with God. You, you have Jesus, if you will, with you. And where you go, Jesus goes. And so you shouldn't go anywhere that you don't think Jesus should go. You shouldn't say anything that you don't think Jesus would say. Right? That's the point. Um, here he's saying, shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Well, no. But how would they be doing that? Well, they would be doing that in the 16th, don't you know? He who's joined to a prostitute becomes one flesh with her, one body with her. It is written, the two will become one flesh. That's the meaning of the two become one flesh in Genesis, as we said before. These, these things are just euphemisms. Um, you know what they mean. 
But the apostle says, look, you're a part of Christ. Your bodies belong to, to Christ. They're members of the body of Christ. Would you join them to a prostitute? And you say, well, never, I wouldn't do that. Well, but if you engage in uh, sexual relations with a prostitute, you're becoming one body with the prostitute, which means you're joining Jesus to a prostitute. Why is that? Because it is written, the two become one flesh. They are being joined together. They become one. In that activity. This tells you that it, well, that it takes two. Um, that uh, there is a union aspect of this that is uh, necessary to constitute a problem here um, that you know the two coming together is what's at issue first Corinthians 6 uh, 19 to 20 don't you know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you whom you have from God you are not your own you were bought with a price so glorify God in your body this is to me the key of understanding you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. Your body is a part of the body of Christ. You are not your own. That is the key to understanding here. Because he's saying the husband and the wife belong to each other. And you belong to Christ. So you cannot be joined with somebody to whom you do not belong. That's the bottom line. In the seventh chapter, this same thought goes or continues, but it goes the other direction. In verses three and four, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. And again, I think you know what that means. And likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So we are subject to one another. But notice what he's saying. The husband is to give the wife the conjugal rights. That you, you are to, you're supposed to fulfill her sexual desires, and, and the wife is to fulfill the husband's sexual desires. They, uh, in some sense, he said the wife doesn't have authority over her own body and the husband has no authority over his own body. It's, it's that balance, right? But what he's saying is they belong to each other. The wife belongs to the husband, the husband belongs to the wife. So the definition really is when you are being joined to and read the two become one flesh right when you're being joined to another person to whom you do not belong that's fornication in a nutshell that's what he's saying so when marriage is defined in the bible as an adult male and an adult female for life it means those are the two people who belong to each other. The husband cannot belong to multiple women. He only belongs to one woman, the wife. Even though we have seen polygamy as a rule and as a norm, whether in scripture or whether in the Middle East or whether maybe in the deserts of Utah, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> it's not biblical. Lamech invented that if you want to be precise about it. Genesis 4. But that's not biblical. That person, that husband, who has multiple wives, is being, you know, for one, he has one wife who really is his wife according to God, but the others, he when he goes into them, he is being joined to somebody to whom he does not belong. He's committing fornication. And he's committing adultery against his real wife. That's the way that it is with polygamy. And I know all you guys were waiting to go out there and find other wives. I understand, but you're just going to have to call that off for this afternoon. Um, but it's also true of persons who are not married, which is really the most common thing. 
The most common thing is people who are not married having relations with one another. Whether they are just dating and they meet up somewhere or whether they live together, whatever it may be, it's not marriage. And if it's not marriage, it's not right. You don't belong to that person. And people say, well, you know, we live together, we share our finances, you know, etc. Yeah, but there's a reason you are not married. Don't say it doesn't matter. It obviously does matter, because if it didn't matter, you would just do it. It saves you a lot of trouble, and it saves you money on your taxes and everything else. No, the problem is commitment, right? The problem is you don't belong to somebody else. You haven't given yourself to belong to somebody else. You don't belong to each other. That's the problem with that one, right? So it helps you to take things apart and, and understand what's happening here, what exactly is wrong with this situation, to understand what 1 Corinthians 6 and 7 are saying. The other side of this, as we said, in 7, it, it goes the other direction. So uh, in 6, we're saying they're being joined to somebody they don't belong to. In 7, we're saying they refuse to be joined to somebody they do belong to. That is also sexual immorality. A person belongs to somebody else, as in the husband belongs to the wife, or the wife belongs to the husband, and refuses to be joined together with them. Uh, this does happen sometimes. People will withhold themselves from their spouses to gain uh, power over them, or for whatever other reason. There's all kinds of stuff out there, like I said. You can't exhaust the blacklist. You know, you can't you, you'll never come up with all the scenarios <laughs> of all the wrong things that could be done. You just can't do that. But what I have seen have been people deciding they, they don't want to be married anymore, and so they withhold themselves from their spouse until their spouse becomes so desperate that they go out and commit adultery. And then they say, aha, I got you now. now I'm going to divorce you for adultery. Like, yeah, but no. Uh, <laughs> no, that's not accurate. I mean, that's the way it might look to outsiders, and you might get away with that lie, but no, the problem is that you refuse to be with your spouse, which is wrong. That is immoral. Um, so, you got to be honest about it. And again, when you see how the Bible defines it, you can make sense of what's happening. You can understand how to parse what you see happening in front of you to know whether it is right or wrong. That, that's all that I'm getting at. But it certainly does exist, and it does happen, and it does um, uh, become a problem. Uh, Jesus himself said, whoever divorces his wife makes her commit adultery. It's exactly what you're reading here. That he belongs to her, but he refuses to give her her conjugal rights. That's his fault. Not that she didn't do, I mean, not that she's okay to go get them somewhere else, but it's his fault because he did not do his job. He did not fulfill his vow. No, she's not right to go and commit adultery, by no means. But Jesus said he makes her commit adultery, as in it is his fault because. He is not staying with her. He is not sleeping with her. So he bears blame in that, is all we're getting at. That is immoral. Um, all right, so, so much for definitions. Like I say, it, it's a fairly, it's actually fairly simple when you set forth exactly what God defined. And again, when you look at Genesis, you can see it. There is male there's female, there are two, and only two parties, they are adults, and is, this is permanent. That is where you can be naked and not ashamed. There is not another relationship where you can be naked and not ashamed. Somebody says, well, what about preschool? Yes, I know. So hard to keep clothes on the children. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. You know what I mean. Um, so we need to move to this topic, which is self-denial. And, you know, the bottom line here is that 
um, these desires, if your desire is for multiple wives or for somebody of the same sex or for somebody that you're not married to, whatever it is, um, you can't do it and be right with God. You'll have to decide that even though that's what I like or I want, it's more important to be right with God. And this is true. It's a, it's a, it's not a truism, but it is a general um, principle for living right with God. There are many things that appeal to people that are not allowed. Perhaps you have a taste for alcohol, or perhaps you like the idea of some kind of drugs coursing through the veins. Um, God will not allow you to do that. You may like it, you may want it, but you know that it's not what God wants you to do, and so you keep your hand back from doing it. You don't do it. Perhaps some fool cuts you off on the highway and pulls over and you pull over and you would like to deck him or worse, but you know that's not what God wants you to do. So you hold yourself back and you don't do this. Be angry and do not sin. Right? This It's a general principle that there are lots of things that we like or that we would like perhaps that we just can't do because God doesn't allow it. There's no accounting for taste. We've said this before, I say again. There is no accounting for taste. Some people say, well, you know, alcohol is disgusting, it's gross to me, I'm not tempted by it because it tastes terrible. Like, okay, good. But some of us think it tastes really good. <laughs> and there's no accounting for the difference there. Why does it taste gross to you and it tastes good to me? Huh? No telling. I'm told cilantro is the same way, that there's like some genetic predisposition. Some people think it tastes like soap or poison or something. I will want to try it. <laughs> I missed out on the blue cheese thing, by the way. Never had blue cheese as a child or adolescent, so it just tastes like mold. <laughs> Whenever I get it in my mouth, I'm like, oh, this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I missed out on that. Um, there's no accounting for taste, friends. You don't know why somebody likes or what somebody likes. You can't tell people, oh, no, you don't like that. That's not natural. No. They may like it just fine. You don't know. But what you do know is that God has prescribed something that we are allowed to do, and that's all that we are allowed to do. And it's no different from anything else. You want to kill somebody or beat them, you're not allowed to do that. You're going to have to deny yourself. Yeah, you, you want to drink? You want to do drugs? No. You, you're going to have to deny yourself on that deal. And the same thing is true here, too. So in verse Corinthians 7, 10 um, and 11, the Lord gives instructions for what happens if your spouse divorces you. So that you tried to keep this together. You tried to do right. But if they, if they don't, what do you do? To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. That's the rule. We don't divorce. Yes, I understand there is one exception in Matthew 19. There is. But as the rule, you do not divorce. But if she does, which is to say, if she does become separated from him, not that she goes ahead with it, but that he divorces her or separates from her. She should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And likewise, husband and wife. So it's not just one way, is all he's saying. But this is the rule. You don't separate what God has joined together. If somebody puts a separation there, your options are remain unmarried or be reconciled to your husband. As in, God still considers that person your spouse. You are still bound by that vow. This is what they're called to. And we said earlier, Jesus said, well, he makes her commit adultery. Yeah, it's true. He bears guilt when he divorces her and leaves her in that situation. But she still, it's up to her whether she does right. 
Okay, we're not we're not trying to absolve anyone of guilt here. <laughs> she should remain unmarried or be reconciled. And in Matthew 19, when Jesus said that there is no divorce allowed except on one grounds, fornication. If your partner commits fornication, the Lord will allow you to nullify that vow, if you will, and, and marry again somebody else. Otherwise, there is no divorce. The disciples said, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. <laughs> they said, if we're going to be stuck forever. <laughs> because their thinking is, well, you can get out of this. There's an escape hatch. And I'm afraid that people think that today, and that's why marriages today don't last very long. They go into it thinking there's an escape hatch, not that it's permanent. But no, it's permanent. You are cement glued to another person. Cement glue, you know, fuses the two. It's like any other kind of weld. You know, the, the two things are being modified, in some sense <laughs> melted, and they come together in the middle. Neither one is the same as what it used to be. There's no way to separate it without doing damage to both of them, right? So they said, if that's the case, better not to marry. Well, Jesus said, not everyone can receive this saying, only those to whom it is given. There are eunuchs who have been so from birth. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And the important one for our point is this one. There are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. What he's, what he's getting at here is exactly what we read in 1 Corinthians 7. That if you are in a situation where your partner has done wrong, has left you, um, or deserted you, divorced you, you have to remain unmarried or be reconciled. If you can't reconcile with them, you've got to remain unmarried. And that is a eunuch who has been made, who made himself or herself a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. For the sake of the righteousness with God, you choose to live a celibate life. Because you know that the desire you have cannot be fulfilled. Whatever that is. We're not arguing whether you have that desire or anything like it. We're saying there is only one way to fulfill. And, and if that is not available to you, then you are going to live a celibate life if you want to be right with God. That's what he's talking about here. And then um, we have also in Luke this idea about, again, self-denial. He said in Luke 9, 23 to 26, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Again, this is a general principle, but it applies here. These concerns about marriage and the fulfillment of desires um, are very serious concerns. I mean, these are the issues of life. They're very important matters. They mean a lot. They have great power and sway in the world. Um, we should not underestimate the seriousness of it, the difficulty of it. You know, we should approach it with kindness, with gentleness, with mercy. When we're talking with somebody about these matters, but the Lord said, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. So a person who has chosen to live a celibate life is taking up the cross daily, very likely. Every time they realize they cannot do this, they need to look away, they need to walk away, whatever. They're, they're carrying their cross daily. And if you would preserve the life that you want, you will lose it. If you would lose, give up your ways for God's ways, then you save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Now this is, again, it's a general principle, but this is what, this is right. It's exactly right. We want these things, and I understand that. Um, I, I definitely understand it. It's just whatever that is cannot be worth your soul you have to be willing to deny yourself 
even some of your most basic desires. Because it's no profit to you to gain everything in the world and lose your soul. Whatever it is, however many or however much, you know, people, dollars, glory, whatever it is that you want, it's not worth it. There's no profit in following these things and losing your soul. You can't be right with God while doing these things. So you're going to have to choose. Whoever is ashamed of me, he said, and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So we say these things not um, not lightly. We understand that it's not popular, that it's not well liked, that it's not the way most of the world conducts itself. I get it. And yet, it is what the Lord teaches. I do think we're helped, if you will, by understanding what the scripture says and what it does not say you know we're not attacking people saying that they are gross or what they like is gross or that they are unnatural you don't know anything about such matters <laughs> you have no idea what somebody likes or what somebody doesn't like what that must be like or why they have those attractions or desires there is no accounting for taste that's not the way you do this um, there are many things that we like or would like that are temptations, if you will, that we deny ourselves and we don't do them. And again, there's no telling why you like those things or why you want those things. It's not important. And there's no point in arguing with somebody, well, you don't want those things. Well, yes, they do. They kind of know, you know, they're the ones who want them. <laughs> don't disrespect people, you know. You can, you can really hurt yourself by doing that. That's not the way. And that's not what's wrong with it, if you will. <laughs> you say, well, it's really weird. That's not what's wrong with it. You know, that's 1950s America. Well, you're a weirdo, right? Superman's alter evil person is Bizarro, remember? When he's weird, that's evil in 1950s America. But no, there's nothing biblical about it. That's not the point. The point is... God prescribed a specific way to do this, and everybody else is called to celibacy. Everybody else is called to self-denial. And it's true of everything you can think of. Every habit, every practice you can think of is governed by God's law, and God's law is uh, supreme, and we aren't allowed to do otherwise. No matter what we feel like or want or think, so don't be ashamed of him and his words. He's saying what's right and what's good, and he's being gentle, but he's being clear and firm, but gentle and loving and merciful and, and truthful as well. The things that we're talking about are very precise. It's not a personal attack. It's not a disrespect, you know. And finally, when we talk about self-denial, I would think of Galatians 1.10. Paul said, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Now, whose approval am I looking for? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Yes, you'll have to choose whom you will serve. That's what it's coming down to. You have to choose whom you will serve. Will you do what God is calling on you to do hard though it may be but the promise of it is very good you know the promise of this um, of following Jesus is being with Jesus when this life is done It's kind of, in the spirit, a truth as well, that we mature, we grow. The church uh, is like, the nation of Israel is, is like a place where we grow up. It's like a home. Jesus said, you receive in this life brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers and children a hundredfold. 
That's true. The church is like a family here, but you leave it and be joined to God in heaven when life is done. See, there's a promise here that you will go on to something else, something good, pleasant, and permanent. And it's heaven. And if you have had good times in your marriage, you know that marriage can be heaven. And if you've had bad times, you know that it can be hell. They're both permanent. So you have to choose which one you will be. Where will your loyalties lie? It's worth it to serve God. It may not be easy, but it's worth it. In the end, it is the best thing for you, for everybody, that we all do what God wants us to do. Um, it is the thing that, that will save. It is the thing that has a payback. It is, it is the thing that has us safe for eternity. It produces the best outcomes. If today you are not a Christian, become a Christian. We've talked about some negative and difficult things, I understand, but hopefully we've impressed upon you the idea that it's worth it to serve God. It's worth it to deny the self, even to live a celibate life. Because God looks on that and he sees it. And even if you and I or people around us are not kind or merciful about it, God is. He sees what you are going through and what it costs you and how you are feeling. He sees that and that is going to your credit. He'll reward you in heaven. Which is not far away. We, we don't have forever here, you know. <laughs> if you're not a Christian, obey the gospel of Jesus. We have um, water that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. If today as a Christian you have not lived right, repent, make things right with him. Go back to where you started and let us pray for you too. Because we also need prayers from the saints very frequently. I'd say if, if you are a person who is, you know, in these things that we're talking about today uh, and you're called to celibacy, well, dedicate yourself in prayer to God. And, you know, you can ask the saints to pray for you too. Uh, we'll, we'll do everything we can to be encouraging, supportive, and helpful. As we're all servants, we're all on our way, and you can help me with something that I struggle with, you know? We lift each other up. The church that belongs to Christ is a place where it is safe to serve Christ. Where it is safe, you know, for us to pray for one another, to reveal, if you will, or to, to describe our um, weaknesses, to confess our weaknesses, if you will, knowing that we have each other's back. We're going to pray for, for each other. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, please let that need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.